everyone, and welcome to the session Rapid Fire Multi Specialty Panel Optimizing Wound Dressings. This is supported by a gracious educational grant from 3M Healthcare and their Medical Solutions Division. I would like to introduce our faculty today. We have uh, Dr. Um, Michael Devine, we have Emily Greenstein, myself, Catherine Mill, I'm an advanced practice nurse in Connecticut, and we have Dr. Schneider. And here are our disclosures. To provide an overview of this session, I will begin by providing a patient-centric approach to dressing selection. Dr. Devine will provide an insight on exudate management. Dr. Schneider will highlight the role of proteases in wound management. And Emily will share an algorithmic approach to bioburden management. Then we will all share how we utilize these dressing advancements in our own unique practices. With that, let's begin. So ulcers are a big global concern. There's clearly no question that we see a lot of diabetic foot ulcers, leg ulcers, and pressure ulcers. We've seen the literature about how much this really costs us in as a healthcare system. And interesting enough, I'm sure we're all familiar with the literature out there that surgical wounds are probably the most expensive for all of the US healthcare system. And we tend to forget some of those other wounds that never really make the literature in great volume, which would be really skin tears and atypical wounds. When we think about the patient, we like to think about identifying those things that stop that wound from healing. And there are things that we can change and we try to influence, but there are a lot of things that we can't do a lot about. We can't change the patient's age. We can't change their stress levels. Sometimes we can impact their immune status. We try to nag them about smoking. Uh, we try to work with their primary care docs um, or providers with their meds, but sometimes we, we can't move that. And all of these things will affect the local wound environment. I think we're all familiar with the three R's of healing. So we have to remove damaged tissue and foreign material. So we know that we need to we debris that devitalized tissue, but we also have to think about inflammation. And Dr. Schneider will be going into this in more detail. We have to replay, repair and replace that lost or damaged tissue. And we really are striving for a robust granulation tissue to be deposited in that wound bed. And then we really need to take care of that wound after it's closed. We have to make sure that that tensile, we do everything we can to improve the tensile strength and keep that wound closed and uh, improve our scar formation. We do know that there are four barriers to wound healing. I think all of us kind of think about infection and biofilm as a cross, you know, in, in a continuum. And that's true, but think about infection as an acute infection and biofilm really as a chronic indolent infection. But we also know that because of the infection or as a result of other issues in that wound bed or in the patient's life, we do have some problems with persistent inflammation. And of course, we all um, deal with excessive exudate because it is really the bane of our existence and it's been, it's a huge issue for our patients. So we do have, we, when we look at addressing, we look at the characteristics that try to address those three R's. We want to deal with localized infection. We want to deal with bio burden. We want to reduce the inflammation, but really most of us are really focused on improving the patient's quality of life. And that is in, dealing with that excess, excessive exudate. 3M actually has a comprehensive portfolio of clinical solutions to address a lot of these issues, uh, including Carousel AG and Promogram Prisma and Promogram, as well as exudate management um, dressings such as Caramax Care, Carafoam, Caraform Narn Border, and the Carousel Gelum. So our, when we approach a patient, we are thinking, let's deal with the exudate. Are we thinking about inflammation? Are we thinking about local infection? 
But when you start looking at the literature, what do the patients think? Well, this is what they want when you, when you read the literature. They want something that's going to heal their wound quick. They want something that's going to deal with the pain, help them reduce the pain without getting them all um, having a lot of intake with medications that may affect them systemically like opioids. And they want their exegate date control. They don't want to ruin their socks. They don't want to ruin their clothes. They want to be able to go outside. They want to go and socialize. And they don't like that odor. So they we want something that will allow, they want something that will allow their usual activities of daily living. And that includes something as very simple as maybe showering. And so they want to be able to get access to these dressings too. And they don't want it to be a hassle. So actually, with we really shouldn't be dealing with the three R's, we should be dealing with the four R's, and that's removal of devitalized tissue, reducing that inflammation, getting that robust granulation tissue, thinking about remodeling and how we can improve wound closure and improve the tensile strength of that scar. But you know what? One of that, of that last four R, fourth R, is respect and identify the patient concerns. Because if we don't find and look at those first, then the rest of the three R's won't uh, go in an orderly fashion. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Devine. Well, thank you, Kathy, so much for the uh, introduction. And what I'd like to do is jump into uh, some of the issues that we see with exudate management and why it's so important to balance that wound environment. So we know that when we talk about the barriers to wound healing, that the level of exudate and exudative manage management becomes in increasingly important. There's a variety of different uh, products available to us. And I think it is important to match the level of exudate with the dressing chosen. What we want to have is a dressing that optimizes the exudative management, but also optimizes healing. So when we look at our goal to maintain a moist wound environment, to reduce my microbial burden, as well as uh, decrease the protease activity and manage humidity, this is what we need and require for wound bed preparation to go on to heal. When we look at the Keramax dressing systems, it's particularly important because these are considered super absorbent dressings. They are, they are layered dressings that come in both the gentle border, which is a Keramax Care, as well as a super absorbent Keramax and Kerafoam, which have this woven ability and super absorbent ability while also wicking the moisture away from the wound bed. It turns out if we compare the Keramax systems with uh, some of the other variety of products available, uh, something as much as uh, twice the efficacy of absorbency comes into play when we're utilizing the Keramax system. This is particularly important, not only for uh, wicking away moisture, but also it turns out for bioburden control. So the ability of the Keramax system to lock in and sequester bacteria away from the wound bed becomes particularly important. It was seen and uh, demonstrated with the use of Pseudomonas bacteria as well as MRSA with, uh, with the shown ability of the Keramax system to lock the bacteria away from the wound bed as much as 99.7% for Pseudomonas and 98% for MRSA. So why is this important? So Kathy mentioned the importance of the four R's and respect of the patient's wishes. And I presented a, a case in the SAWC last year of a gentleman with severe venous stasis disease as seen in this poster with the photos on the left. This gentleman refused negative pressure wound therapy. And as much as I thought he would benefit from negative pressure wound therapy, he declined. Well, with that, we had a really difficult time with exudative management. And it wasn't until we introduced him to the Keramax system that we were able to achieve some wound progression. We continued him on weekly dressing changes as well as compression, but with the addition of the Keramax system, we were able to achieve wound progression. <laughs> 
So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Schneider, who will share some information regarding the ORC collagen and the importance of the science of ORC collagen with wound bed pr preparation and progression. Thank you, Dr. Devine, for that very interesting uh, and elucidating presentation. My presentation is going to be on ORC collagen and the science behind wound healing. My name is Dr. Rob Snyder. I'm Interim Dean, Professor and Director of Clinical Research at Barry University School of Podiatric Medicine. So first and foremost, we have to really look in terms of the patient from a holistic point of view. Obviously, the patient, these patients are often sick. They have multiple underlying comorbidities and chronic illnesses. They're often older. And there's also some environmental factors like nutritional status and stress and, of course, the oxygenation of the tissue itself. And, uh, and once we look really holistically at these patients, we can then look at the wound microenvironment, certainly looking at exudate management, chronic inflammation, proteus activity, and bacterial bio burden. Here's an example of a comorbidity that is really extraordinarily detrimental to healing. This shows poor survival of dialysis patients with unhealed wounds, particularly when there is critical limb ischemia. And in this particular case, an unhealed wound certainly was an independent risk factor for mortality in dialysis patients with critical limb ischemia. So in thinking in terms of bacteria in general, of course, um, there's a continuum of bacteria. Uh, first and foremost, we have contamination and we have colonization. These are bacteria basically that are planktonic predominantly. They're sitting on the surface of the wound. When they're contaminated, they're not replicating. When they colonize, they are replicating. But again, not creating too much uh, difficulty and virulence. Of course, when we move into critical colonization or what we now refer to as a cult infection, uh, things get a little bit more concerning. And at this point, we have to really consider uh, our options. And of course, uh, these wounds can often become locally infected and systemically infected as well. So uh, in the first two categories, contamination and colonization, we really need to follow vigilance. We have to make certain that these wounds are not going to move uh, further into critical colonization and infection. And of course, but once we're there, we have to intervene very often to allow these wounds to heal appropriately. And of course, as you have uh, increase in bacterial loads and you have virulence, of course, you have increasing clinical problems, including biofilm. So, of course, uh, first and foremost, we have to be certain that we know the differences between infection and inflammation. When you have infection, of course, uh, microorganisms are always the underlying causative agent, which is going to lead to cellulitis. When we're dealing with infl an inflammatory process, there's really little or no benefit to using uh, anti-infective agents. But, of course, there is this overlap, and this Venn diagram clearly shows that there's pain, delayed healing, persistent increase in exudate, suboptimal granulation tissue like friable granulation tissue, and in duration. And of course, in patients, particularly with diabetes, it's often very difficult to tell the difference. So what is the problem? Well, of course, if you look at a normal wound healing cascade, uh, starting with hemostasis through the inflammatory phase of wound healing, proliferative phase, and ultimately the reparative stage, there is an orderly and well-orchestrated time frame here. It's very predictable. And, and it's also a very, very complex dynamic. This cartoon really just uh, shows some of the overlapping phases, the fact that this is a continuum, a continuous process, and also very, very complex. Now keep in mind that we often don't think about wounds when they're acute. When do we think about them? Well, we think about them the same way we think about our TV screen or a computer screen. We only think about them when they're not working. And of course, that's the basis behind the chronic wound. In a chronic wound, of course, you have unresponsive or senescent cells. You have a non-migratory hyperproliferative wound edge, high levels of proteolytic activity, which, of course, you don't see in an acute wound, efficient or unavailable growth factors, poorly functioning receptor sites, and bacterial interference. And, of course, even though we're looking at um, diabetic foot predominantly here, all chronic or stall wounds share the same biochemistry, irrespective of etiology. So we really do need a paradigm shift in wound management protocols, and we need to truly understand the wound microenvironment because this will lead to better choices. Now, we also need an algorithm, something that we can kind of look at to make certain that we're touching all those bases that we have to. First and foremost, is the wound even healable? We have to make sure we identify the cause. Are we dealing with a wound? Or are we dealing with a malignancy or a vasculitis? Patient-centered concerns. What's the patient's vascularity like? Does the patient see a primary care doctor on a regular basis? 
Are their blood sugars controlled, et cetera? Once we find all those things and, and look at this patient holistically, then we can look at the wound itself. And one way to remember this is the algorithm DIME, D-I-M-E, debridement, control of infection, inflammation, moisture balance or imbalance, and wound edge preparation. Now, wound bed preparation, of course, is a very important step, not only treating wounds, but also protecting against infection. Wound bed preparation was first looked at about 20 years ago. It's been updated since then, but of course, uh, what's occurred is they're looking at these wounds much more holistically at this point. So why are proteases important for wound healing? Well, what are proteases? Proteases are protein degrading enzymes. There are two basic categories, serine elastase, which comes from the neutrophils and MMPs or matrix metalloprotease. They function optimally under normal physiologic conditions. They're rarely seen in an inactive proenzyme format. But what tends to happen is even though they are normally controlled by natural inhibitors, as an example, tissue inhibitors of metalloproteases, very often they raise out of control and if nothing is done to protect the wound and protect the extracellular matrix, then it can be entirely destroyed. Now, the extracellular matrix really is the infrastructure for the cells, but it does a lot more than that. Something is very interesting, and this is called dynamic reciprocity. It was first looked at by Schultz and colleagues a couple of years ago. What this basically means is that the extracellular matrix communicates with other cells in the wound, like endothelial cells and fibroblasts. And if you destroy the extracellular matrix, you disconnect that communication, and the wounds will, fa will fail to heal. So as far as the role of proteases in normal wound healing, they do very many things. Formation and degradation of the fibrin clot. Of course, they clean the wound of bacteria. They debride the wound. Uh, they allow cells to move like keratinocytes and fibroblasts. And they also work on selected growth factor activity. And again, seen in low levels, they're very, very important for wound healing. But very, very often you see excessive amounts of proteases, particularly in the chronic a wound in the inflammatory phase, you see large amounts of neutrophils. Neutrophils are pouring out serine elastase. So you have a significant amount of inflammatory protease activity, which dominates the chronic wound, MMP2, 8, and 9, and serine elastase specifically. This study was done by Serene and colleagues a couple of years ago, just looking at this process, and they found two very interesting facts. Number one, as protease activity increases, the probability of healing decreases with that appropriate intervention. And in fact, they found also that if this was not addressed properly, only 10% of wounds would heal. So how protease is dealt with today? Well, first and foremost, we look at ORC collagen, promegran. It's 45% oxidized regenerated cellulose, 55% collagen. It's a bioresorbable uh, matrix. It's amorphous. It's an open pore matrix and really works very significantly on this area. It's synergetic in its approach. Basically, not only is it uh, a hemostatic agent, uh, but it does something very specific to MMPs. It acts as a sacrificial substrate. What does that actually mean? Well, MMPs, rather than gnawing on the wound itself, will gnaw on the collagen. So therefore, you're protecting the extracellular matrix. Adding the ORC is very important. ORC is a very strong hemostatic agent, but it also lowers pH, so it helps control bacterial growth. Another very important fact is that it inactivates proteases, such as serine elastase. So not only are you decreasing the body's ability uh, to uh, have destructive forces from MMPs, but also serine elastase. Now, why do we use 55, 45%? Because at that level, you had 100% reduction of elastase, and of course, there was a significant reduction of MMP8 and 9 as well. Now, what happens if you have an ulceration that you feel may have a high level of bacteria, but is not infected? Well, certainly adding a small amount of silver is very, very important here. And in this case, we have Promogram Prisma. This has a silver salt of ORC at 0.25% ionic silver. Now, what's really important to understand here is this has been shown at very low levels not to harm host cells. And this is three parts per million. So again, very, very safe to use in the wound. Now, what does silver do? Well, silver certainly is bactericidal against 150 strains of bacteria, yeast, and molds commonly found in wounds. And we also feel that it may have a significant effect on wound biofilm. But take a look at this log reduction, very, very substantial, even at this low level of silver. And just looking at those organisms, MRSA, E. coli, et cetera, very, very significant organisms that could be detrimental to wound healing. Now, early adoption, of course, significantly improves outcome.
There is a substantial amount of clinical evidence to support this, level one evidence. Uh, there are almost 700 patients in clinical trials that have clearly shown the effectiveness of this product. Now, something else to keep in mind, and this is just as a side benefit, uh, this is a split thickness skin graft that was performed. Uh, and of course, negative pressure wound therapy was utilized to keep the graft in place for five days. Now, the problem with this is the fact that when we do these grafts, very often um, the donor site becomes very, very painful. We use Xeroform, which has um, a compound in it, uh, bismuth, which will dry the wound out. So it almost looks like a potato chip. It is often very, very painful. We may have a very good solution for this by using Promagran or Prisma as an example. We have several benefits. Prisma specifically is double density. It will dissolve so you don't have to remove it. It has an antibacterial effect and it's strongly hemostatic. So again, by the time this dressing dissolves, uh, the epithelialization is almost complete. It's also important to understand that by utilizing the uh, wound bed preparation model, we can really understand better uh, how to use uh, quality measures. So the takeaways here are chronic, chronic wounds really represent an aberrant biochemistry, including elevations of proteases and bacteria. And clearly these elements must be managed to move the wound out of the inflammatory phase of wound healing into the proliferative phase. Utilization of ORC collagen and ORC collagen with silver adjunctively could certainly create a paradigm shift in wound microenvironment and certainly allow this as part of the wound bed preparation model to be very beneficial towards wound healing. And of course, incorporating these therapies clearly may aid in acceleration of these non-healing wounds. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Schneider, for that great lecture on ORC collagen and how we can utilize it in our wound care practice. So my name is Emily Greenstein, and I'm a certified wound and ostomy nurse practitioner at Sanford Health in Fargo, North Dakota. I'm going to talk to you today about bio burden management through the use of an algorithmic approach. So when we look at wound infection statistics, specifically wound site infections, about 31% of all wound infections um, are surgical site infections. The incidence about 2% in 2006 and increased to 5% in 2016. Uh, we do notice that the higher and it's higher in the lower and middle income countries. This uh, surgical site infections can increase patient mortality by up to 3% and it prolongs hospital stays. So why do we care? So when we're looking at this we care because it can raise the admission costs around 20,000 to 27,000 um, per stay. It's the most common healthcare associated infection that's monitored by the CDC. So how do we know a wound is infected? Oftentimes we get asked, um, how do I know my wound is infected? Is it draining pus or what, how is it infected? Do we use Google? A lot of times I have patients who use Dr. Google. They'll come in, they'll be convinced that their wound is infected. But as clinicians, we know that there are clinical signs and symptoms of a localized infection. This might not hold true the original or the classic signs of infection for patients who have chronic wounds. So classic signs of infection include pain, erythema, edema, heat, Perilence in duration, you might have fluctuation or some of that crepitus. There's friable bright red granulation tissue. There might be an increased malodor. There could be newer increased pain sensation. Um, diabetics who did not have any sensation now are all of a sudden complaining of pain in the area. There might be epithelial bridging or that uneven granulation tissue. You could have a wound that's stalled out. You could have a wound that's starting to all of a sudden enlarge or get satellite lesions around it. And then, like I said before, that hypergranulation tissue you might get. Then it's also important to remember that not all red and discolored skin lesions represent infection. As you can see in this picture below, the one leg has cellulitis, but the other leg, which is also red, is showing that chronic venous insufficiency. So these patients, they might present with that hemosiderin staining or the stasis dermatitis, which is red, but that is not necessarily a sign of infection. So wound infection in clinical practices, um, the wound infection continuum, the International Wound Infection Institute came up with this uh, graft and kind of how it 
makes you look at it as a clinician is you can have a wound that's contaminated, colonized, goes to local infection, to spreading infection, to systemic infection. So why do we really care about this? You can use this type of model to help guide your practice in selecting um, topical treatments versus systemic treatments for your patients that have infection. It's also important to remember as um, Dr. Schneider had talked about previously about that critical colonization or when does that uh, wound turn in from critical colonization to a localized infection. So one way that we can decide on um, what dressing is right for us to use when is by using an algorithm or a decision tree model. So this is an example of a decision tree model selecting the right dressing at the right time. So you start by your patient assessment, making sure you're assessing all their comorbidities that can impact their wound healing. Are they a diabetic with an A1C of 10? Are they a venous stasis ulcer who refuses to wear compression? And then you also need to look at clinical lab assessments. Um, what's their white count? What's their nutrition like? And you also wanna take a complete history and physical. Have they tried other things? Have they been using any over-the-counter antibiotic ointment? Have they been putting anything into their wound? Has anything helped? Has anything made it worse? And then you look at their risk stratification based off of your assessment. So when we look at risk stratification, we can use the white, yellow, red model. And white meaning they had no comorbidities, their blood work was normal, there's minimal psychosocial issues. Then you go down to, was there signs of inflammation at their wound? If no, you go on to standard of care. That is, you know, moist wound he healing, making sure that you have good wet wound bed preparation. Um, then we go on to the next one, which is a yellow in our risk stratification. Those are one to two chronic diseases, abnormal blood work, or psychosocial issues. So meaning if the patient um, is living by themselves, they can't take care of themselves, is the patient homeless? And then we look at the wound, is there non-viable tissue? If yes, go on to debridement. Uh, if no, then we move on to the heavy bio burden or risk of biofilm development. And this leads us to the dressing that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, which is the AG oxy salt dressing. The next group is the red. So when we look at the red, is there three or more of the following? Chronic diseases, abnormal blood work. If yes, then it goes back kind of to the same thing as the yellow went to. So non viable tissue, making sure you're doing good debridement, good wound bed preparation looking at signs of bio burden, are they at risk for infection? If the answer to those is no, you can actually go on to using the ORC collagen dressing or the ORC AG collagen dressing, so the Prisma or Promogram. This kind of breaks it down to what those risk stratification groups are, like I had talked about previously, the white, yellow, and red. So now I'll talk to you, what is the AG oxy salt technology? So you might be thinking to yourself, is it just another hydrofiber, another silver dressing on the market? Well, let's start with the basics. What is silver? So the definition of a salt first is the sodium chloride is neutral. Salts are ionic compounds composed of an equal number of cations and anions. So the product is electrically neutral. And this is gonna be important to remember that the product in a salt is, is electrically neutral as we kind of go through here um, talking about how the dressing works. So once compounded, it's exposed, is the oxygen atom is exposed to heat or water. The redox reaction when one substrate reduces and the other is oxidized, it becomes oxidized and it's released in three different ionic states. So it's important to know that there's three ionic states, different ionic states, one plus, two plus, and three plus. So this kind of shows that releasing. So it's one plus, two plus, three plus. And why do we care about this? Because oxygen becomes reduced as a free oxygen molecule. We're also gonna remember that for a little bit later too, because it'll show how the dressing provides um, some oxygen to the tissue base. 
And this shows um, that process just going on. Next, we talk about the currency of chemistry and the value of electron potentials. So tying this back to our initial talk about the oxy salts, so you can see there's the Ag compound. It has the three electrons on it, and they're getting pulled. So when we look back at the chemistry of this, so the H2O2 is, or hydrogen peroxide in wound healing, we often talk to people or we hear that use of hydrogen peroxide in wound healing, it can be cytotoxic, we're not supposed to use it. But when we look at it in the, this type of dressing, the H2O2 is a key stimulus to signal tissue damage. So it recruits inflammatory cells, kills bacteria, and low concentrations can promote healing, but high concentrations inhibit healing. Like I said, if you're dumping straight hydrogen peroxide onto a wound, that's going to be cytotoxic. In chronic wounds, excess levels create a hostile wound environment that can cause uh, tissue damage. So this is just looking at a study that was done um, at the University of Manchester Labs the left is a hydrogen peroxide molecule, not to be confused with the molecule of uh, silver oxy salts that we looked at earlier. So clearly this is one way that oxygen can be released in a chronic hypoxic wound environment. And this is a study that just showed that observations from testing the antimicrobial and antibiofilm activities in various metal compounds and copper sulfate shows that, that AG is an effective agent in eliminating planktonic populations of E. coli, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas. AG7 NO11 prevents biofilm formation, eradicates established biofilm populations, and reduces the biomass of established biofilms. So basically, this slide is just telling us that the AG oxy salt compound is effective in eliminating these types of microorganisms. So you can see on this grid, it shows how the enzyme or the silver is in comparison to other antimicrobial agents. So the salts, the silver sulfonamides, um, silver sulfate, your metallics, your nanocrystallins, um, compared to honey, iodine, other enzymes available on the market. And you can see it denatures existing bacteria and biofilm concentrations. It's changed more frequently in wounds with heavy exudate, and it's avoided in individuals that have a silver sensitivity. So a lot of this is a lot of science and it will make a lot more sense when we come to the cases. And I'll show you how the silver oxy salt dressing actually works and how the technology can fit into your wound care toolbox. Thank you. I'd like to thank my panelists for excellent presentations. During this portion of the session, we will translate this clinical background to practical cases demonstrating how we use each of these dressing advancements in our unique practice settings. So I do a lot of work in post-acute care, and I'll be talking about cases from that setting. So there are a lot of clinical problems that we see in these settings, including exudate, which Dr. Devine talked about, um, infection, and which Emily talked about, um, and difficulty in maintaining dressing integrity and bleeding are two issues that really come up quite frequently in this setting. And I think we have to realize what our dressings are made out of. So we have Parmogram Prisma and Promogram and the carousel gelling fiber dressing. These are excellent dressings to use when you have excessive bleeding or even just a little bit of bleeding. You have a lot of these patients have atrial fibrillation, they're on anticoagulants. And um, so when, when you have a dressing available, remember a lot of the, of the Promogram has Surgicel in it, and we've always used Surgicel for clotting. So don't forget that we have other utilities for these dressings besides dealing with infection and dealing with inflammation. So here's a, a patient who had a uh, skin graft in a long-term um, care setting, and they had taken the dressing off, but they 
neglected to realize that his INR was 6.2. So um, it's a Friday afternoon, there's nobody around and people are starting to panic. So they called me, I was down the hall seeing somebody else and I said, oh, you know, you, do you have some Prisma here? And they said, yeah, sure. So we just put it on. We were able to um, get achieve hemostasis and, and then complete the dressing change for the patient. So he didn't need to be sent out. He um, didn't have a lot of blood loss and we controlled the situation. A lot of times we have difficulty in maintaining dressing integrity. This was a very challenging case of mine. She uh, was a demented patient. She had a, um, uh, a, a diverting colostomy and she had a propensity for only using one certain ostomy product. And when you change um, her from something from a two piece flange based system to a one piece, which would be a little bit more forgiving on her peristomal hernia, she would actually rip it off. So we, we were kind of being patient, we were being patient centric in saying we need to work around this. So what we ended up doing for this pressure injury is to reduce the inflammation and treat any bio burden from all the leakage from the stool. Uh, we ended up using um, Permogram Prisma and we, want, we needed to put the wafer on top of that. And to do that, what we ended up doing was using uh, a 3M silicone tape to tape over that. And then we could get good adherence to, of the ostomy appliance to the patient. And you can see here in this photo, how this patient has epithelialized um, and uh, the, the wound and peri wound itself actually reduced. We found we had less scarring too. So it was a very uh, successful outcome. So I wanna hand this over to Dr. Devine who will be presenting his cases. Thank you, Kathy, and great cases, I must say. And uh, as you know, I work in both the acute and the post-acute setting, uh, but I wanna share um, two sets of cases with you. One is a case of venous stasis ulcer where I utilize a combination of products. This is a 67-year-old gentleman who presented with a pretty significant venous stasis ulcer, significant in that he had been present for a couple of years and really was uh, failed to progress uh, despite advanced wound therapy. Again, he had a past medical history of longstanding venous insufficiency as well as diabetes. He had been undergoing weekly debridements, had, had uh, tried a variety of skin substitutes as well as placental tissue, was kept on compression, but it was only until we used the combination of the silver oxy salts and superabsorbent dressings that we were able to uh, allow the wound to progress. He presented to our wound clinic, and again, he was followed by some of my wound care partners with this wound ulcer. Again, uh, really uh, doesn't look particularly large, but really just failed to progress. Ultimately, we started him on the uh, silver oxy salts, and we utilized this in combination uh, with a superabsorbent dressing. He was having a significant amount of drainage and maceration that had continued, but this was seemed to be the only thing that seemed to contain that drainage. After a couple of weeks of therapy, we started finally seeing some wound progression, both the reduction of wound size as seen by the new epithelial edges, uh, as well as some small islands that started to appear in the central portion of the wound. We continued him with additional oxy salts as well as superabsorbent dressings combined with some other foam dressings. Uh, the benefit of these superabsorbent dressings is that they can be utilized in combination therapy. This double approach really helped to contain the drainage. At three weeks, you can see the wound started to contract as seen by the peri wound area that's clearly showed some evidence of primary wound contraction. This is a good example of the, oxy, the silver oxy salt being placed onto the wound bed. At 28 days, again, we see um, continued reduction in wound size. And at this point, because the wound seemed to have a very healthy appearance with healthy granulation tissue, I, elect, I elected to proceed with a definitive closure with a split thickness skin graft. This is one week after his skin graft and he uh, was able to heal uneventfully. 
and went on to heal uh, and as he is an ambulatory patient. The next case I'd like to cover is one, a very complicated surgical case. And so one might ask, why would a surgeon use primary wound dressings? Well, I can share with you as a wound care clinician, it has become a very big part of my surgical um, uh, armamentarium. This is a 70-year-old gentleman who had a very difficult uh, medical history. He had had an, uh, he presented with an early sepsis following an incarcerated uh, hernia. He ended up having a re-exploration because he had a small bowel resection, which led to a uh, primary leak of his anastomosis. His primary history was that of Crohn's disease, so he already had some debilitation in terms of disease. He presented initially in the acute hospital setting with this very severe necrotic wound. He had soft tissue necrosis, but because he had early sepsis, it was um, thought that he was not a good candidate for operative intervention. We initially treated him with negative pressure therapy in the acute care setting with installation. We found that while we were making some improvement as seen by the lower portion of that wound, he was noted to have gross evidence of an active fistula. With that in mind, he was taken immediately to the operating room by general surgery and they were able to contain the fistula and bring it out as a contained fistula through that midline incision. We treated that incision with negative pressure therapy as well as a, an appliance to try to contain the uh, enteric contents. It was a very difficult case to manage. You can see the uh, peri wound irritation in that lower aspect of the incision, and this continued to break down the remainder of the uh, surgical incision site. At day 15, he continued to have peri wound irritation, and as a result, the wound seemed to get bigger and bigger. This was a team approach as every dressing change utilized at least three of my wound care nurses as well as myself. Part of it was to try to uh, just manage the uh, ostomy or stoma output from the active high output fistula. At day 30, we surrendered to the fact that this wound was uh, just succumbing to the enteric contents. And while the negative pressure was helping to contain it, we decided to take him to the operating room to try to uh, do a partial closure and get better topography around the actual stoma for a better seal. At 65 days, he was continuing to do better. However, with the continued high output, we still had difficulty in achieving a seal. A small local flap was created surgically as seen in the slide on your right, and this helped with the topography, but we still had evidence of a, a peri wound because of the irritation. At 75 days, we had to revisit our goal of therapy, and we realized at this point, the most important thing we could do was to uh, try to achieve uh, some uh, maintenance of the wound to allow the patient to be discharged to the post-acute setting. At this time, we elected to switch our uh, treatment from negative pressure therapy to a collagen dressing with Promogram Prisma. At this point, because this wound was present at 75 days, as, as Dr. Snyder has suggested, this uh, inflammatory response can occur even with an acute wound, and at 75 days, this was now a chronic wound. Utilizing the Promogram Prisma, we continue to achieve wound bed uh, progress. You can see the healthy granulation tissue around the stoma. Additionally, this was a wound that then could be managed as an outpatient. The dressings were applied carefully by our wound ostomy incontinence nurse inpatient, and we sealed it with a, an appliance ring, again, to try to maintain the enteric contents and contain the amount of peri wound irritation. This was a good example of the uh, real intricacy of the dressing, which took uh, several uh, minutes to perform, but the team did it as a team approach and we were able to get it down to a science. Finally, at 82 days, we were able to discharge that patient to home. As an outpatient, he continued with progress. We followed him weekly in the wound clinic. And you can see at six months, we had a very manageable wound, which ultimately he was able to go on for surgical closure. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Snyder to share some of his cases, uh, specifically with the diabetic foot and diabetic neuropathy. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. 
thank you, Dr. Devine, for those very interesting cases, uh, very elucidating. I, I learned a great deal from them. Uh, my first case is a right hallux wound with severe pain despite uh, diabetic neuropathy. So this is a 53-year-old African-American male, insulin-dependent diabetic, non-palpable pedal pulses. He had a cool right foot, foul-smelling wound, severe pain despite the fact that he's neuropathic, duration is five days, no previous treatment. He's febrile with a white count of 18,000. So what are you going to do? Are you going to order an angiogram and a vascular consult before any local or surgical intervention? Will you take the patient to the OR urgently for extensive debridement prior to vascular intervention? Or would you treat this patient outpatient with local wound debridement and topical antiseptics and culture-driven PO antibiotics? Well, what I elected to do was take the patient to the operating room and uh, after uh, that was done, uh, we had a successful endovascular intervention. Uh, we did a transmittatorial amputation after that. And the patient, however, continued to have significant tissue loss. And uh, the wound became very challenging as far as closure was concerned. So here's what the wound looked like. Uh, we were able to close uh, some of it. Uh, we used cadaveric allograph uh, on the other. And here's just another example of what this wound looks like. So in this particular case, of course, we needed intravenous antibiotics for six weeks. We needed a multidisciplinary approach. But what are you going to do now? Well, in this particular case, the patient benefited from negative press of wound therapy for two weeks. However, still had an open wound. So what now? Well, in this particular case, I used collagen ORC with silver for two weeks and then ultimately transitioned from here to a collagen ORC to closure. So my next case is what I refer to as necrotic toe. Here's a 68-year-old uh, male with insulin-dependent diabetes, has a weakly palpable posterior tibial pulse, monophasic waveform, ABI of 0.3, not very good. A necrotic right great toe was obvious. The patient had severe pain despite severe diabetic neuropathy. It was crepitous, so we were very concerned about gas in the tissue. The patient had a white count and a CRP that was normal, which is uh, sometimes seen in patients with diabetes that are immunocompromised. The patient was also a febrile, and he had the wound only for five days. What was really troubling was that there was gas in the tissue, of course, which is a significant problem. So what would you do? Would you order an urgent uh, interventional radiology consult with potential intervention prior to surgery? Would you order an urgent operating room debridement, including partial first ray amputation? Would you hospitalize the patient for intravenous antibiotics, but wait until the infection began to resolve? Or the patient really has no constitutional symptoms. So after culturing, why not just treat empirically outpatient with oral antibiotics and local wound care? So this is what we elected to do. We took the patient urgently to the operating room for a very significant debridement and a first ray amputation. The patient then had undergone a successful distal endovascular intervention. We couldn't do that on the front end because this was a life and limb threatening emergency. Now we have three vessel runoff. Of course, we've used a multidisciplinary approach. And we began to use negative pressure wound therapy. Now, what are you going to do? Well, the patient had three weeks of negative pressure wound therapy, uh, utilizing adaptive touch as an interface between the foam and the wound itself. And of course, the patient will require six weeks of intravenous antibiotics. But the patient is still exhibiting copious drainage and increased bio burden. Now, what are you going to do? Well, here's what the wound looks like, and this is what I did. I used silver cell non-adherent for a period of two weeks. And then at this point, the wound was doing very well, and I transitioned to collagen ORC with silver for two weeks. Of course, I could have used this to healing because of the fact that the silver concentration would not have a deleterious effect on the cells. So we're left with this, and what I did in this particular case was I just used moist wound healing to closure, and you could have used either hydrogel, which I did, and a foam.
So this next case is a highly exudating wound. He has a 60-year-old male with venous insufficiency and lymphedema. He has palpable pulses, but he's puddling fluid on the floor in our waiting room, which is an, an amazing amount of copious drainage. And of course, the dressings were required to be changed three to four times per day. So uh, we really weren't getting anywhere here. So wh what do you do here? Here's an example of what the wound looked like. And here's what the dressing looked like even after a few hours. So what would you do? Would you hospitalize this patient for severe infection? Would you stop compression and use foam and change the dressing as often as needed? Or would you consider Keramex care and continue with compression? So in this case, I elected to use Keramex care with compression. I utilized it for four weeks and then I changed to Carousel AG. So this is what the wound looked like. And this is the dressing itself. This is Keramax Care. What's interesting about this dressing is you have um, wicking that pulls the fluid directly into the dressing. So if you were to touch the back of this uh, dressing itself, it would actually be completely dry. And of course, after three months, this wound was completely healed. Thank you for those great cases, Dr. Schneider. So now the cases I'm going to talk to you, the first one is about a pressure injury. So this is a patient of mine. She was a 71-year-old female. She had a stage four pressure injury to her anterior ankle. She had previously been treated with multi-layer compression wraps, <clears throat> collagens, wet to dry dressings. Um, at the time when she came to us and we decided to start her on the Carousel AG or the AG technology with OxySalts, um, she was about three weeks out. You can see in the pictures coming up that there was increased granulation tissue quality and a decrease in slough. So this was her initial presentation. So you can see that there was quite a bit of um, slough, necrotic tissue within the wound bed. There was also some exposed tendon. Um, I did sharply debride it first, and then we applied the uh, um, carousel AG with oxy salts to the wound, um, remembering that this type of a dressing is for moderate to heavily exudating wounds, and that when you do apply it, you want to have um, a little bit of overlap over the wounds because it does shrink in size when it gets wet, as most gelling fibers do. So you can see on day five, she came back um, to us and uh, this is what it looked like prior to us removing it. After we removed the dressing, this is what it looked like. Uh, in the second picture, you can see that there's improved granulation tissue. There's a lot less slough and necrotic tissue within the wound bed. And then you can see we applied it again um, at day five, had her come back day 10. On day 10, there was even a more improved granulation tissue within the wound bed. We um, did, like I said, sharp debridement, applied the oxy salt gelling fiber, changed it every five days. Um, after three weeks of uh, the uh, application, we did change her to an uh, amniotic graft with ORC backing, which was applied weekly. And you can see at month three, the tendon was covered. And at that point, we did transition to her to just a foam cover dressing. Oftentimes, I do utilize the hydrofiber in wounds, like I said, that have a heavy bio burden, or if they're just chronic, not healing, they might be stalled, they might have a lot of adherent slough. The dressing does a really good job of releasing that oxy cell, bringing oxygen to the tissue bed, which helps break up some of that um, slough and necrotic tissue. So my case number two is of a patient that had calciphylaxis. She was a 62-year-old female, end-stage renal disease on dialysis. She had had a previous history of anemia and cervical cancer. So our treatment plan was to start her on the silver oxy salt dressings. Um, for her, we did end up changing it every other day because of exudate and pain level. Um, at day 30, we started her over to the ORC collagen dressing, which was applied every three days. Um, the wound was biopsied in the beginning, uh, which showed calcium or which showed calciphylaxis. So she was from the beginning started on sodium thiosylate with her dialysis. So you can see this is the initial presentation on, it was um, full thickness. There was a lot of 
exposed dead fat within the wound. There was um, a lot of drainage. So we did use the oxycell gelling fiber, change it every other day. And as you can see, the wound um, progressed on and at day 30, it was completely clean. It was um, then transitioned to the ORC uh, collagen. And at day 45, it was completely healed. Thank you, we'll now take some questions. Uh, if you can submit them in the tab to the right, uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Rob Snyder and uh, welcome to the Q&A. Our first question um, uh, is uh, an interesting one. Uh, we talked about a patient that had a very inflamed, raised uh, ulceration, uh, was on antibiotics, had extraordinary pain, was originally on Prisma. Uh, there was some yellow discoloration uh, in the wounds. So the patient was changed to uh, an enzymatic uh, debriding agent, uh, did somewhat better. But I guess the question is, um, how do you explain the fact that the the uh, area became yellow when the collagen was used and uh, what other factors could be at play. So Michael, why don't you take uh, this one? Sure, so a really good question. And I think a question that comes up a lot with collagen dressings is uh, when you see that kind of yellow appearance after collagen dressing, is that necessarily bad? And I, I, I make a comment when I see these patients in clinic, I always talk about that slough, S-L-O-U-G-H is different than stuff. And the stuff, S-T-U-F-F, may be something that's not necessarily bad. And so the question really addresses something very important that you have to look at the total picture of the wound, i.e. if there is more redness, indoor drainage, or foul odor, then you may be concerned that perhaps there is more slough, which may be uh, signs of a secondary infection. So, so with that, um, this, this type of wound we, we talked about just as a group, there, there's a lot of things that could be at play here. Um, and I think, Kathy, you made some interesting comments about the hyperinflammatory response. Um, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, when, when you change a dressing and your wound starts to have hypergranulation, as, as this case dis, um, discusses, you know, what you really have to think about is uh, what's really going on. So you actually have more inflammation. And so when you have hypergranulation tissue, you could be simply having too much bacteria. And, and that could be some of the issue. But I want to go back to that, some of the, the, the characteristics that were, were mentioned in this case. I, you just wonder if, if there would have been something else going on. Um, you know, did we have pyoderma gangrenosum? Did we have an atypical wound? You know, was a biopsy considered? So a lot of times when you have that kind of response, you just really want to start over and, and start from the beginning and think everything through. Excellent, excellent response. Uh, the next question is relating to a chronic neuropathic ulcer that is macerated uh, due to the patient's edema. Patient has been using compression stockings and diuretics. Uh, but the concern is, does collagen still work in this scenario? So uh, Emily, why don't you take this one? So um, in this type of scenario, in these patients, I will use a collagen, but I will also make sure, you know, that they're offloading it properly. And then looking at why do they have all of this edema? Um, do they need to have vascular studies done? Do they need a different form of compression? Um, what's causing this? Just because they have edema and they're on a diuretic, that doesn't mean we're treating the underlying disease necessarily. So looking at that and then just making sure that you're offloading also, as you know, any type of dressing we put on, if the patient's walking on it, they're going to shear it off or it's not going to be effective. So also when a patient has, um, has edema secondary to venous insufficiency, diuretics really are not going to uh, be beneficial. And the stocking itself may just not have enough compression. Um, so um, I think keeping those things in mind, perhaps upgrading the compression may have actually in, in, in the long run uh, decreased uh, not only the edema, but also the drainage as well. So the next question, when using Prisma on the donor site, what secondary dressing do you use and do you change the secondary dressing and add more Prisma? So uh, the answer is uh, we can use a foam dressing. 
uh, over the over the uh, Prisma on the donor site. Remember the, the the keys to using Prisma, and the reason why uh, I believe that it works so well is several fold. Uh, number one, uh, it will evaporate, so you don't really actually have to remove it. Um, uh, secondly, it has an antibacterial effect, and it also has a very strong hemostatic component. So what normally happens at the end of a week when that uh, that secondary dressing is removed, the, the, the uh, donor site is usually um, re-epithelialized. So the next question uh, is relating to Prisma and Promegran. It states that it's now considered a DME uh, and they really can't charge for it. So the question is, can it be prescribed on an outpatient basis for patients instead of just dispensing it in the office at the time of wound care? Kathy, maybe you can answer that question. For yeah, us. I'd love to do that. So um, first of all, in a clinic setting, so it, it, in an office or an outpatient clinic, uh, any dressing that you put on is considered part of your evaluation in management. And so you sh shouldn't be charging for something like that. Um, so a lot of clinics do use, um, you know, something a little bit more simple and then order it as a DME for, for the um, patient to use at home. Um, and you can do that for using some of the dressing companies that are out there uh, and they deliver it to the patient's home and um, that works out really, really well. Very good. Very good. So uh, the next question is, a patient has a wound with excessive exudate where a uh, Promogram Prisma was being used. The patient had a question about whether or not the excessive amount of exudate was due to having high protease levels. Uh, would that be a correct correlation? Well, it certainly is possible if that's the case. But uh, if in fact it was, in my view, likely the uh, Promogram would uh, or promogram prisma likely would have started to decrease that drainage. So when you think in terms of chronic wounds in general, certainly you have high levels of, of proteases that need to be managed, but there may be more going on in this wound as was previously outlined. I think you have to basically look at this much more holistically to find out exactly why there is an excessive amount of exudate? Uh, is there infection there? Uh, is there some other underlying problem like a vasculitis or pyoderma gangrenosum? Uh, one last question, um, and that's related to uh, uh, negative pressure wound therapy and uh, dressings like Prisma and Promegran. Can we actually use these in conjunction uh, with uh, negative pressure and are they synergetic? So Michael, why don't we end with, uh, with you? On this topic, sure. I know you discussed it. Well, I, yeah, so I, I use a lot of negative pressure in conjunction with many of my primary dressings because I do think there's some synergism. Um, I will mention that um, right now the use of negative pressure, specifically with Promogram Prisma, is not um, FDA approved for that. And so um, just to, to stay on label, um, that's not recommended per se. Um, if you ask, have I done it? The answer is yes, and with good results. But I think you have to be careful whenever you're going to an off-label use. Um, there are certainly um, some benefits of negative pressure with all the dressings with regard to that ability to get the wound to granulate and become more vascularized. So certainly there is some synergism that makes sense to progress towards healing. But just be aware of some of the off-label versus on-label use. Excellent response, thank you. So uh, I this this ends the Q&A session. I want to thank you all for your participation and your excellent questions. Please log back in tomorrow starting at 8 a.m. Central Time and 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the start of the main symposium. And we also look forward to being together again in person in Las Vegas for SAWC Fall. Thank you very much for your time and have a good evening.